I'm Howard Friedman, and I'm the director of the Jewish Community Library, which is a program of Jewish Learning Works. And I want to welcome you to today's program with Hannah Kronfeld for the first of two programs looking at the poetry of Yehuda Amichai. The second program, which will focus on Amichai's poems that became the basis of popular Israeli songs, will be led by Ilan Wittenberg and will occur on Wednesday, April 22nd at 7 o'clock. We'll put a link to register in the chat here for this program. I want to thank the Friends of the Jewish, Jewish Community Library for making all of what we do possible. If you'd like to see programs like this continue, I do hope that you'll consider becoming a friend of the library, which you can do at www.friendsofthejcl.org. Without the support of the Friends, we simply would not be able to have programs like this. Today's program is made possible in part by Emily Brewer in honor and memory of her father, Dr. Richard Brewer. Some logistical notes before we begin. We are offering automatic live closed captioning for today's program. It can be accessed by selecting live transcript at the bottom and showing uh, and choosing show subtitle. For some people, it uh, probably automatically turned on. And if you'd like to turn it off, simply select live transcript in the menu at the bottom and choose hide subtitle. Note that this is an automatic transcription and Hebrew terms are not going to be interpreted accurately. In fact, I will turn it, the transcription off during the read reading of Hebrew poems. Because we do have a large group, everybody will be muted. However, when there are opportunities for people to participate, please use the raise hand option and you will be unmuted. And if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat for consideration at the end, but we can't guarantee that we'll get to all of them. It's really an honor to be joined by Hannah Kronfeld, one of our true gems in the Bay Area. She's the Bernie H. Williams Professor of Comparative Hebrew and Yiddish Literature at UC Berkeley, specializing in modernist poetry and translation studies. She's the author most recently of The Full Severity of Compassion, The Poetry of Yehuda Amichai. With Hannah Bloch, Zichrona Livracha, she translated Amichai's extraordinary work, Open, Closed, Open, as well as selections of his poetry for Robert Alter's collection, The Poetry of Ye Yehuda Amichai. The two also collaborated on Hovering at a Low Altitude, the poetry of Dalia Ravikovich, which they presented at the library years ago. She's currently working on a book titled The Land as Woman, The Afterlife of a Biblical Metaphor. Kana has received many awards for her work on both Hebrew and Yiddish poetry, but what touches me more is that I have known many of her students over the years and the love and appreciation they express for her as a scholar, mentor, and human being is extraordinary. We are so glad to have her join us today. Kana, I turn the virtual floor to you. Thank you so much, Howard, and thank you, Noah and um, uh, Rose for uh, putting this together, it's, it's such a, a, an amazing thing to be able to see so many uh, old friends and uh, new faces uh, bringing us together uh, around the extraordinary poetry of, of Yehuda Michai in times when division is uh, really threatening the fabric of our society and of the society in Israel. And, um, I wanted to do uh, this as a, um, a teach, to use this as a teachable moment uh, to start a conversation uh, about the importance of emerging from binary oppositions, from uh, us and them, which is what Yehuda's poetry is all about. Um, I don't think this audience needs much of an introduction to Yehuda Michai's poetry. 1924 in Würzburg, Germany, 2000, uh, he died in 2000 in Jerusalem, just around the time of the second intifada. Uh, and um, a lifelong friend. Uh, and uh, I was really blessed to be able with my uh, dearest friend, uh, Hannah Bloch, Zichron Ali to um, translate his uh, latest, his last book, his magnum opus, Open, Closed, Open, but also to much earlier uh, when I was, when I had just arrived in Berkeley, pregnant with Maya, who is somewhere here, 
uh, now at Princeton, um, I was helping uh, Stephen Mitchell. I was his native informant when he was translating the, the early poetry for the selected poetry, which became the standard text. And Hannah Bloch was working with Yehuda in Jerusalem on the later poetry, what was then the later poetry. So I, I wanna start with a poem um, that <clears throat> has been uh, appropriated for nationalist celebration, but it's because people don't bother to read it closely. Um, this is a poem called Jerusalem 1967, and it's uh, number five in a series of poems by that title, which um, Yehuda published right after uh, the Six Day War, the 1967, the June 67 war. And in order to understand it, you need to know, uh, first before I read it, a couple of things. One is, uh, oh, and we lost the text right now, but you'll, you're gonna bring it back? Okay. Um, Noah, could you bring back the text, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, if you look at, at the first line of the English, and I'm also gonna be reading the poems in Hebrew for there are enough people here I can see who, who could benefit from that, um, that uh, with a little bit of arithmetic, you can figure out that Yom Kippur 1967 is the first Yom Kippur after the Six Day War, after the June uh, 67 War. And the other thing that uh, you'll notice is that uh, Stephen put in the year of forgetting because what he's doing, what Amichai is doing in the Hebrew is calling the year Tashkach instead of Tafshin Kafchet, he's actually turning the alphabetical date into a word, a word that comes from the root for to forget, right? Or, or to cause to forget. So, um, and then the other thing you need to remember for, uh, in order to, to kind of start understanding how incredibly critical this poem is, including and maybe mainly self-critical, is uh, just to rehearse in your mind as you're listening to it, the laws of atonement for Yom Kippur, under what conditions will you actually be forgiven, right? What two kinds of transgressions are there and two different kinds of asking for uh, permission, uh, 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 forgiveness. Okay, without further ado, the poetry. On Yom Kippur in 1967, the year of forgetting, I put on my dark holiday clothes and walked to the old city of Jerusalem. For a long time, I stood in front of an Arab's hole in the wall shop, not far from the Damascus gate a shop with buttons and zippers and spools of thread in every color and snaps and buckles. A rare light and many colors like an open arc. I told him in my heart that my father too had a shop like this with thread and buttons. I explained to him in my heart about all the decades and the causes and the events why I am now here and my father's shop was burnt there and he is buried here. When I finished, it was time for the closing of the gates prayer. He too lowered the shutters and locked the gate. And I returned with all the worshipers home. Now the Hebrew. Uh, Noah, could you do me a favor and, and yeah, raise it a little bit, thank you. Beyom Kippur, bishnat tashkach, lavashti bigdei chag kehim, vehalachti laira atika birushalayim. Amadati zman rav, lifnei kuch chanuto shel aravi, lo rachok mishar shchem, chanut kaftorim veruchsanim usli lechutim, bechol tseva. 
ולחצניות ואף זמים. אור יקר וצבעים רבים, כמו ארון קודש פתוח. אמרתי לו בליבי, שגם לאבי הייתה חנות כזאת של חוטים וכפתורים. הסברתי לו בליבי על כל עשרות השנים והגורמים והמקרים שאני עכשיו פה וחנות אבי שרופה שם והוא קבור פה. כשסיימתי הייתה שעת נעילה. גם הוא הוריד את התריס ונעל את השער. ואני חזרתי עם כל המתפללים הביתה. The poem starts by giving us a sense that the speaker uh, self-righteously, right, celebrates uh, being different from the crowd. Everybody is going in one direction. Everybody is rushing to the synagogue. He's going in the opposite direction. This is before all the tourists started going to, um, to East Jerusalem, to the Arab part of the city. Uh, And then instead of standing in front of the Holy Ark, he's standing in front of this hole in the wall shop. And what is he doing? Right? He thinks that he's asking forgiveness or that he's explaining why we had to conquer this guy's territory. And why he now, this shopkeeper now has to be uh, occupied, lose his uh, sovereignty. And he's doing it by expressing an analogy between what happened to Jews, including his father, uh, in Europe during the Holocaust and what is happening now. What we are forced to do, supposedly, right? Um, But in the process, he is also not able to say a single word. The Hebrew makes it clear and uh, the translation is uh, kind of follows the Hebrew idiom. I told him in my heart, right? Uh, that is, there was no actual speech act. Nothing was actually uttered. Now, um, please feel free to, um, Raise your hand, I, I, I can't see you, but uh, Noah and um, Howard and Rose can. Um, if you want to address those two conditions, right, under which uh, you are actually granted forgiveness, right? How do you atone on Yom Kippur? And what happens here? Just, you know, in terms of the strict religious uh, demands or prescriptions. Nobody wants to, I mean, it's, it, a lot of people know this, right? It's uh, basically the distinction between uh, sins or transgressions between uh, a person and his God and her God. Uh, and it's called Ben Adam Lamakom. Uh, and the other is if you have wronged another human being or other human beings, right? If you have wronged other human beings, what do you need to do? You need to actually go to them and ask and obtain their forgiveness. There has to be an actual speech act, right? You have to open your mouth. You have to say to the explanation in this case, right? Uh, and uh, you have to actually receive that forgiveness. Everything else you can do in your heart, you can do by talking, right? Uh, to, to God in your heart, in the synagogue or elsewhere. And, and Carol Dorf asks, uh, adds, and you need to repair the problem, right? So you need to actually show that there is something that can be done. Now, everybody among his readers, his original audience in 1967, when the mood was of general euphoria, they all understood uh, what this is about, but this was consistently uh, read as uh, something that is uh, very grandiose of him. 
And as uh, I see that Dan Slobin was commenting, um, hi, Dan, uh, that he's not even asking forgiveness. He's not asking anything because he's not speaking. But in that lack of speech, he is explaining. However, that explanation takes the form of mapping metaphorically the synagogue's holy ark on this hole in the wall shop. And by implication, God, right, on the Arab shopkeeper. Uh, now, I, I, it's very hard for me to follow the chat, so I would really mu much rather have people uh, speak, be un unmuted and speak. I really want to hear you guys and not just see the text. Is, the, is it possible, Noah? Yeah, anybody who, who would like to speak can, can raise their hand to be unmuted. Um, in the meantime, I'll just say that um, Emily Brewer sh shared, you know, can it be that the, the, the Palestinian shop owner is God, given that he speaks from his heart only? Um, and that, that really re resonated with me because the, if the shop is an open arc and then if the gates are closing afterward, then that, you know, it works with that metaphor. Exactly. And the word for the closing of the gates, right, Neila, that holiest of prayers, uh, during the hour of grace, Shat Chesed, which is the name of one of his poetry books, the time that we will meet again in the next poem, between day and night, which is that liminal space where the gates of heaven are at their most open, but it's also the one where death is most, most dangerous. It's the most precipitous time, right? So um, that is exactly the mapping of that, you know, mundane act of pulling down that those metal shutters, right, on those, uh, um, roll down shutters on, on the hole in the wall uh, shop. And, you know, he hides that it actually is not the same because when you close the, the arc, you close it this way. Uh, but of course, th this is incredibly radical, right? Uh, but because great poetry is too dangerous not to appropriate, this had to be bracketed. This incredible potential for critique had to be forgotten so that we could turn Amichai into uh, the poet of Jerusalem. He kept writing about how he, he loves the thin Jerusalem. He doesn't like the double one, right? He doesn't want Yerushalayim. He wants Yerushal. He wants to cut the dual uh, into a singular, right? He wants half of it. It didn't help. Also, um... Hannah, it seems like um, it's like how relevant is it to the shopkeeper that his father's shop was burned there? Yeah. You know, and his father's buried here. It's like right. the shopkeeper is losing his sovereignty right. in this place and time, which is a different place and time than where his right. father lost his shop. And from I mean, the shopkeeper's father. point of view, what is going on, right? This guy is staring who comes there you know stands and doesn't buy anything right doesn't give him a stuftah, doesn't you know just stands in front of his shop and stares the whole day and then goes away so the lack of in between the lack of communication between self and other turns him by the end of the poem into uh, one who is as bad as all the others, because on the way back, he goes off with, with all, all of them, right? He's no longer even deluding himself, or we're not deluding him that he's going against the grain. I see that Vered wants to say something, and then we need to move to the next, next, next poem. Hi, Vered Hamuda. Hi, what a pleasure. Thank you, Hana. I want to say that my personal reading of this um, not saying out loud is um, has to do with the not being comfortable to say the prayer that he's supposed to. So this is the justification that is supposed to be given 
to this is the narrative, this is the conversation that is expected, right? That to put these things one next to the other. But he realizes that it's not really a conversation. It's not really an excuse. And um, I, I think that, that he's unable to pray the prayer that he's supposed to pray uh, in this moment. Does that make sense? Like the- that's wonderful. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And um, the distance between the speaker and what we call technically the implied author, right, is clear. You know, we're not supposed to, even though Yehuda's father had kind of a notions business, it was not a little hole in the wall shop, right? He, it was a wholesale, you know, uh, traveling uh, salesman. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, Judy, maybe next time uh, with the next poem, because uh, I really want us to get us beyond the critical moment to, to a real affirmative uh, position then if not this, then what? Uh, love becomes the metonymy, the, the instantiation of the way to, to bridge uh, that division, which uh, institutions of power are so invested in. And um, the poem that I think uh, my dear, uh, Hannah Bloch, Zichrona Livracha, translated quite uh, brilliantly. This, this is part of, of a, a larger poem, but just this stanza is, is astonishing. Uh, Hebrew, and this is Beinaim or between. Between, Beinaim is both between and interim, so it's both spatial and, uh, um, and uh, temporal liminality, and that uh, as I've argued, is the central principle of Amichai's uh, critique of separation, right? Of the separation of uh, body from soul, of Jew from Arab, of male from female, um, of God from human beings. Uh, the whole system that um, of binary oppositions that uh, you know, he presents an alternative to, but the alternative is threatened. It's being in between with all the powers pressuring uh, him. Uh, and uh, he's usually lucky to describe, or his poetic subject is usually lucky to describe somewhere else in there with him in that brief between. So let me just uh, read this poem first in English and then uh, in Hebrew. Where will we be when these flowers turn into fruit? In the narrow between, when the flower is no longer a flower and the fruit not yet a fruit. And what a wonderful between we made for each other between body and body. A between of eyes, between waking and sleep. A twilight between light, not day and not night twilight between light, not day and not night. Beinayim. Efu nihye kshe aprachim haele yahafchu perot ba beinayim hatsarim? Kshe perach shuv lo perach vha pri terem pri? Veeze beinayim niflaim asinu ze la ze bein guf le guf? Beinayim einayim bein erut le shena? Beinaim arbaim, lo yom, lo laila. So it seems like, you know, just one other poem about how brief life is, how brief love is. But if you look at the last four words, lo yom, lo laila, that echoes for the Hebrew reader and maybe also for the English reader because it's a famous song. Uh, the liturgical poem by Yanai, which um, which is a karev um, right? Uh, so it's really the beginning of the messianic age. It's from that endangered liminal stage of being, daring to be in between, refusing the oppositions, right? Uh, that 
some kind of redemption will come and we'll actually be able to read one poem that I think takes it to a, uh, a utopian place, uh, albeit with a twist at the end. So um, I want to have time to go to the next poem and maybe we'll have more of a discussion there. Um, and that is a very early poem, I think it's, yeah, it's the one that's right on top here. And it's, um, I think the first instantiation of uh, his big concept of uh, in between that uh, th this is actually from the early sixties. And um, this is the time when in Israel, the state of generation poets led by, he was a member of them, he was part of them, but it, it's led by uh, Natan Zach, who recently uh, died, um, was very happy with itself. I mean, they were really excited about doing something totally new and daring in Hebrew uh, literature. That's also the time when, you know, the new state was very excited about this new Hebrew, this new experiment. And um, he uses the translator or more uh, specifically the Turgeman, uh, the, and, and let me just say a word before I read it about who the Turgeman was. Um, Bill Hallow's Zichron Olivracha, Nanette's uh, late husband, Nanette Stahl from Yale is here, hi Motik. Um, really researched the history of it, going back to Assyrian, maybe Hittite, but then uh, forward into um, Babylonian um, Talmud, um, where the Turgiman was a go-between, between the rabbi uh, who was already speaking, who was still speaking in Hebrew, and the audience who didn't know any Hebrew anymore or didn't know very much Hebrew and uh, was uh, uh, you know, fluent in Aramaic and later in whatever native uh, Jewish language they were, you know, uh, they were using. And the Turgeman, unlike the rabbi at the pulpit, the Turgeman was standing at eye level with the audience and was interpreting uh, and sometimes also just repeating and intoning the words of the rabbi. So the Turgeman as a model for what we all are, taking apart that obsession, especially in the West, with originality, especially of poetry, but you know, not just, uh, and, and celebrating transmission, celebrating mediation, celebrating being in between. Okay, so it's a very complicated poem. We're just gonna talk about a couple of parts of it. And let us not get excited, for a translator mustn't get excited. Quietly, we pass on words from one person to another, from one tongue to other lips, unawares the way a father passes on the facial features of his dead father to his son, yet he doesn't resemble either of them. He's just the go-between. We shall remember the things we had in our hands and dropped, whatever belongs to us and does not belong to us, and tis not for us to get excited. Calls and their callers have drowned. Or it is that my beloved passed on to me a few words before she went away so that I would raise them for her. And no longer shall we say that which has been said to us on to other sayers. Silence equals admission is not for us to get excited. Velo nitlahev. Velo nitlahev ki lo yitlahev turgeman. Beshekit naavir milim me adam le adam, misafa lisfataim acherot. Uvli la dat, kemo sheav maavir klaster pnei aviv hamet livno, vehu eino dome lishnehem. Urak metavech. נזכור את הדברים שהיו בידינו ונשמטו, דעיקה ברשותי ודלה עיקה ברשותי, ואין לנו להתלהב. קריאות וקוראיהן טבעו. או כי אהובתי מסרה לי מילים אחדות, 
בטרם נסעה כדי שאגדלן למענה. ושוב לא נאמר את מה שנאמר לנו לאומרים אחרים, שתיקה כהודאה, אין לנו להתלהב. So uh, I just want to uh, point to a couple of things. Words in Hebrew are gendered feminine, but they look masculine. Those are the kind, because they have an im, those of you who know even a little bit of Hebrew know that an im and ending in the plural is masculine. Those are the words, as we'll see in the next poem as well, that Yehuda loves, right? The way in which, if you will, um, Hebrew breaks down the distinction between feminine and singular, uh, feminine and masculine, the way in which the Uh, exception to the rule, right, uh, allows us to break down those dichotomies. So the words um, in the middle, um, I guess it's the end of the next to the last stanza. One of the ways, there's like a series of takes on how a poet, right, uh, creates. It's all for different forms of transmission, right? It's all the masoret, it's all the mesira, right? There's no anxiety about it, no anxiety of influence, no need or um, uh, illusion that he's original. But at the end of the third stanza, he's describing a transmission in, in a gendered uh, way that is, you know, early 60s, completely untraditional, right? So uh, my beloved, the, and in Hebrew, it's clear that it's a, a, a woman, a huvati, right? Uh, passed on to me a few words before she went away so that I would raise them for her. So the beloved is feminine. The words are like little daughters, because words are feminine. And he is entrusted with the words he got from her to raise them. So he is the mother, the, the biological mother uh, has left. It's perfectly okay for him to be doing the child rearing. So that's the model of creativity. The words that we get from women and the women poems that we raise Uh, on our own, uh, if we are men. Uh, it is really a consistent feature of his uh, feminist poetry. He is completely identified, uh, self-identified um, with the feminine and with the feminine in the masculine, as we'll see, but also in terms of um, his major models, Elsa Lasker-Schule and Lea Goldberg, okay, are the two Uh, women that he credits with uh, being his poetic paradigms. So, um, and then the other thing that I think is absolutely fantastic here uh, and is hard to translate because Hebrew has such a, um, an embodied sense of the words for language, right? So uh, the two words for language are safa and lashon, safa is lip, right? Uh, the word language in English also ha has an embodied sense, but it's in the etymology. It's not part of the uh, speaker's everyday experience. So what he is describing here in that mediation, in, in, in that um, transmission of words, right, is an erotics of transmission, a linguistic kissing, right? From one set of lips, from one language to another set of lips. Safas fatayim. So using the dual again, right? The dual as undoing the separation, the dual form of the plural, which Hebrew uh, and Arabic uniquely have. Okay, so there's singular, there's dual, and there's plural. Yerushalayim, for example, has the ayim, right? Um, so uh, if you look at the poem between, if you look at this one, whenever you, you hear the sound ayim, you know that it's that, that dual. So this erotic of transmissions is such a salve 
for me, it's such a corrective, such a tikkun to that whole craziness about being original and the putting down, not only of translation, but of any kind of poetic, what we call intertextuality, the way the texts talk to each other. In the Jewish tradition, that's the beginning. You always begin by translating and then interpreting, right? Even in English, the term interpretation has to do with that. So as a translator, it also is kind of um, uh, allowing me to live um, a little bit in peace with, with everything that we do not manage to do as translators and maybe to get beyond that other um, erotic metaphor, which I detest, uh, of betrayal and fidelity, right, that you talk about in translation studies, you know, betraying the original, the traditore, traditore. Okay. Um, somebody had a question, but I would much rather hear from them in person. I, I, I just can't follow the, the chats. I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Um, okay. But I have a question. Go ahead, um, The The line, um, whatever belongs to us and does not belong to us, or de ika birshite de la ika birshite. Yeah, does that look familiar? <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, it looks like it's um, Mish Mishnaic or from, um, from the Talmud. Yeah, it's Aramaic yeah. and it's um, uh, from the, uh, of the whole process of cleansing your house of chametz before Pesach, right? So uh, you, you kind of um, disown if you if you didn't manage to cleanse everything to get rid of all the chametz of all the non uh, of all the, how do you say chametz in English? You say chametz. 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 Okay. Anything that is uh, not kosher for for Passover, right? You get rid of the wheat. You get rid of this. You get rid of that. And then you just uh, perform a speech act that whatever was and was not of my possession, uh, I'm getting rid of. So this kind of using Talmudic Hebrew. Oh, Levin, thank you, Froma. <laughs> um, so um, using Talmudic Hebrew actually to make a Zen point of um, coming to terms with being just a go-between um, as something that is giving up, a giving up of ownership. There has never been a first sentence, my mentor Benjamin Harshav used to say, right? We're all recycling words. That's Yehuda's term. It's all a big uh, recycling of uh, project, word recycling project. And God is the, big, the biggest recycler of words. Okay. Um, so let me just give you a taste of what it would mean for Yehuda Amichai in his last book to propose a tikkun, to propose a utopian world in which this benign state, this betweenness, this undoing of uh, stable categories of gender, of nation, national identity, of the divine versus the um, uh, the human of kosher versus unkosher or impure, um, what that would look like. And I, I would like us to take a look at a poem that I could spend three hours talking about. It's, I think, one of the um, most amazing texts he has written, and it's the opening poem of a series of, poetry, of poems called The Language of Love and tea with roasted almonds, and you'll see what the tea with roasted almonds is in this poem. Now, um, this attempt to create a new language, it always starts with language in Yehuda and ends in politics and philosophy and everything else. But um, this takes place in, in a city that many of you know is a binational city, Akko, 
right, on the coast, on the Mediterranean coast. Um, many readers will actually think that they know, I, for, for, for example, think I know uh, exactly which cafe is being described. I think it's Abu Cristo on the, on the shore uh, where they, they happen to serve tea uh, with roasted almonds. Almonds are soaked in rose water. And then, you know, it's very important. They don't become part of the tea, right? Part of this whole idea of in between is that you understand the other, you meet the other, but you don't turn them into you. Uh, so, so here we go. And again, it starts with a meditation on language. To translate it was not easy, but we, what we did was um, what we usually do in translations from um, a Hebrew that is so steeped in prior texts. And that is allow the Jewish textual practice of citing the Hebrew, right? And then giving the gloss and then giving the interpretation importing that into English. Now, I don't know if it works, but um, some of it we had to invent because Hebrew, uh, English doesn't have a dual and all of that. So, um, um, so Akko is a binational city. And the only other thing that I will say is that Laila, the word for night in Hebrew is, as he tells us, the name of a woman, but it's not a name of a woman in Hebrew. It's a name of a woman in Arabic. Okay. <clears throat> Laila, night, the most feminine of all things is masculine in Hebrew, but it's also the name of a woman. Sun is masculine and sunset feminine, the memory of the masculine and the feminine and the yearning of a man, of a woman in a man. That is to say, the two of us, that is to say, we. And why is Elohim God in the plural? Because all of him are sitting in the shade under a canopy of vines in Akko, playing cards. And we sat at a table nearby and I held your hand and you held mine instead of cards. And we too were masculine and feminine plural and singular, and we drank Arab tea with roasted almonds, two tastes that didn't know each other and became one in our mouths. And over the cafe door, next to the sky, it said, not responsible for items forgotten or lost. And now in Hebrew. <clears throat> Could you move the Hebrew? Thank you, Noah. Laila, Hadavar Hanashi Beyotel, Ubilshon Zaha, Aval Hugam Shem Isha. Yom Hu Zahar Vimama Nekeva, Zecher Zahar Bankeva, Uchmihat Isha Baish, Klomar Shneinu, Klomar Anachnu. ומדוע אלוהים הוא בלשון רבים? כי הוא יושבים בצל סוכת כפנים בעכו ומשחק קלפים ומשחקים. ואנחנו ישבנו בשולחן קרוב והחזקתי את ידך והחזקת את ידי במקום קלפים וגם אנחנו היינו זכר ונקבה ורבים ויחיד ושתינו תה על שקדים כלואים שני טעמים שלא ידעו זה את זה והיו לאחד בפינו. ומעל הדלת של בית הקפה, ליד השמיים, היה כתוב, לא אחראים לחפצים נשכחים ולדברים שעבדו. אוקיי, okay, I would like to do this a little differently and, and actually call on you guys to, to, um, to tell us what you see here and, and, and uh, what you like, what you don't like, what you have questions about. Maybe you should go back to the English, Noah, so that uh, more people can see it. So 
so clearly Laila looks like uh, if you if you know any Hebrew uh, or you can just guess, it has a feminine ending, ah, right? Feminine singular ending, but it morphologically, that is, it, it looks like it should be feminine. And as Amichai tells us, it's the most feminine of all things, Lilith after all, Lilith, right? Uh, but it's masculine. And it's the name of a woman. So the language itself, Hebrew in its beautiful precision, in its exceptions, right, uh, allows for this androgyny, allows the destabilizing of gender and sexuality. And of course, we couldn't do uh, Yom and Yemama. Day and Yemama is the 24 hour period, right? Uh, so we, we, did, we drew on sun in, you know, for example, all, all the puns on sun and sun, and uh, the sun is masculine and John Dunn, the sun rising. <clears throat> we did um, sun and sunset, but it's really interesting that he immediately goes into that first version of the creation story where the feminine and the masculine are both aspects of the divine and are both within us, right? And in this machismo <laughs> culture of, the, of, of Israel, to be able to say that, uh, to be able to write that as part of a utopia. Right? Um, Dee wanted to ask a question? Yeah, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm unmuted. I'm not very familiar with this poet and I came in late, I apologize, but I've heard um, your explanation of several of the poems and I'm probably influenced because I've been watching the PBS series about Ernest Hemingway yes. and, and the androgyny that was really, that marked his whole life. And so I, my question is simply, especially in this poem, but in some of the others where you're talking about a, a union of opposites is this really an example of androgyny in this poet's way of thinking? Absolutely. And, um, and, but again, for him, and I guess for, for I saw that, that Hemingway series too, it was really uh, powerful and troubling. Um, but for Amichai, it's all anchored in language because the Hebrew word for uh, trace or for memory is the same root as the word for masculine. So what he's doing is defanging the masculinity of the idea of memory, right? And saying, no, it's the memory of the feminine in the masculine, right? So in Hebrew, it sounds really like a, a tongue twister, zecher zachar, right? Uh, the idea that what we remember by is the name of the male, right, of the family, that's the line, that's the lineage, is being upended, right, by saying, no, what we have to do is actually uh, acknowledge the feminine within us. And that is a trace of an older primordial union, right, uh, that maybe goes back to that God that was a plural. So he connects the plurality of God with that, you know, totally ungrammatical locution, right? In Hebrew, it is, he uh, are sitting. We couldn't do it because, you know, English is so um, sensitive about grammar. Hebrew is much more uh, pliable that way. So we, we played with all of him are sitting, but the Hebrew actually is ungrammatical. He's returning God, right? To his plurality. And that plurality is because he has, or they have, right? Both a, femin a feminine and a masculine, the one and the many, if you will. Okay, so we have raised hands, great. Who was first? You guys decide. Um, Noah, you saw who, who was first. Yeah, Carol, go ahead. Um, I was wondering how, you know, so we have Hebrew and we have Arab, but not Arabic. 
And I was wondering how that fits into this um, schema of uniting masculine and feminine. Well, that you see is the frame of the whole poem. The poem starts with Arabic, with Laila, mm -hmm. and ends with Arab tea and is located in Akko, right? The word Arab doesn't appear in English in the Hebrew, but uh, we added it. There was a big fight about it. Uh, and we had to take it out actually from the final public uh, published version. So um, this is your final version? This is my final, this is our final version, but right, it's not the, the one. one that entered the altar collection okay. because the widow objected to the word Arab. Mm -hmm. But clearly he is couching the whole abolition of binary distinction in the distinction between Jew and Arab or, um, right? And, and God becomes this bunch of Arab men sitting there playing cards. Froma? Oh, you're muted. Well, first of all, uh, the uh, sitting in the shade under a canopy of vines is certainly a biblical reference about each man under his tree, under his fig tree, is what right. to say. But it also reminded me of what happens to Jonah in which the vine dries up and he's left out there by himself um, by not obeying the word of God. It comes in Elohim. So I don't know, my question would be the, the two, the, the double mean uh, possibilities of the shade under a canopy of vines. That's my first mm -hmm. question. And I have another one. Yeah, no, it really, uh, the way that it reads in the Hebrew, it's especially since it's with the word sukkah. Okay. Uh, it, uh, uh, so it really is like sukkah shalom. That's the, I think the main, the main allusion is to, uh, to messianic times, right? To a utopian return uh, to living under one canopy, if you will, right? Under one sukkah and, uh, in, so the in, word canopy is Sukkot. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the second one, the last line, I can't get over it. it just... Okay, isn't that something? Yeah. All right, so clearly, you know, utopia, utopia, until you get to the fact that the owners, <laughs> whoever owns the territory here, says, we're not responsible for what you have lost. Okay, he doesn't say anything political against the occupation, against the subjugation of Palestinians, nothing. He just uses a sign that actually is a very common sign, right? If you leave your laptop there and, and somebody takes it, we're not responsible. But clearly that is the twist that comes very often in Amichai's poetry at the end, reminding us of the reality that we live in. Thank you for that question, for those questions from us. So good to see you. Um, I think we have one more poem. So I'm sorry to, you know, if we if we want to stay later, we, we can we can uh, get to Joel's question. Maybe is that okay? No. And I just want to end with um, a poem that is part of the last one of the final series of poems in his final book, and who will remember the rememberers. Um, and I kid you not, each and every one of these poems make pokes fun, not always a very good natured fun at commemoration obsessions of the Israeli culture and uh, uh, the, the lack of uh, trust in the authenticity of the experience, right? And something that we all uh, are familiar with, how do, one poem says, how do you stand at a memorial uh, uh, ceremony? Do you stand up straight or do you slouch? And, you know, this ends up being read with high seriousness in, in American uh, synagogues. Um, th there is a, a real problem in translation that American English, unlike British English, is especially in order to, uh, or kind of resistant to sarcasm and irony, it's considered bad form. You cannot understand Amichai without it, um, even though, as we saw, he goes beyond it. So another thing, uh, just as a pointer, is he loved cooking. 
So this is the recipe for preserving uh, memory. And who will remember and what do you use to preserve memory? How do you preserve anything in this world? You preserve it with salt and with sugar, with heat and deep freeze, vacuum sealers, dehydrators, mummifiers. But the best way to preserve memory is to conserve it inside forgetting. So not even a single act of remembering will seep in and disturb memory's eternal rest. Okay, now the Hebrew, please, Noah. Umi iskor, uvame meshamarim zikaron, bame meshamarim bichlal baolam, meshamarim bemelach uvesukar, bechom gavoa ubehakpaa muka, baatima muchletet, beibush uvachanita. Aval shimur hazikaron, hatov beyoter, ולשמרו בתוך השכחה, שאף זכירה אחת לא תוכל לעולם לחדור לתוכה ולהפריע את מנוחת הנצח של הזיכרון. So this is one of his last poems. We started with 1967, the year of forgetting. And the connection that he's making here between memory and forgetting, something that all the great theorists of cultural memory uh, have not emphasized enough, right? That there is no remember what Amalek has done to you, right? Without forgetting what you have done to others, for example, um, at different times, what you did in the book of Joshua to the Canaanites. Um, in other words, turning it into a harmless recipe that emphasizes the precision of the process and then sticks in there the word chanita, mummification, that uh, complete uh, petrification of any life. This is the deepest critique of the culture of commemoration that does not recognize flow. That actually, in the end, in the last line, kind of uh, closes the, the book on memory commemoration as death, because I think we, uh, we actually translate it as eternal rest. In Hebrew, it's absolutely uh, the same. It's the term that actually means death. Again, this poem keeps being read with high seriousness as you know, a poem for the uh, Yom Hazikaron, the, the day of uh, commemorating uh, the fallen soldiers. So um, the openness of the culture to self-critique, the openness of Amichai's poetry to literally self-critique um, is, is what I would like to leave you guys with, but also I, I really want to open it up now um, if there is still uh, some time and energy uh, for discussion. So Noah, it's okay if, uh, if uh, Joel wants to uh, yeah. pick up the question from before or other people. Joel and um, earlier Judy Bastin, if you um, have anything you wanna share and also um, uh, Moshe Levin. And any of the poems, you know, it doesn't have to be this one. Go ahead. Linda, go ahead. Oh, hey, Hannah. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm great. So I want to go back to the- But um, I don't see you. Where are you? Well, <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll turn the camera on. I'm just going up to my, to oh, my okay. office. No problem. Um, so I want to go back, if you don't mind, to the, um, to the Layla. Yeah. Uh, poem and uh, I was wondering about 
the word uh, Layla in Hebrew, I, I don't speak Hebrew clearly. Um, and I was wondering if it, it means night in general, right? Yeah, that's and the common, uh, common word, unlike Arabic, you know, you, we have Lail also, but unlike Arabic, Laila is the common Hebrew word for night, and it is, it looks feminine, but is masculine. So, because it's interesting to me also uh, for your choice of sun and sunset, is that it's exactly the opposite in Arabic. For Layla, it is a feminine word, and Layl, the general night, Layla is a night. Right. Um, and then sun is a feminine word, sunset is masculine. Yeah, but there's so, no sun or sunset in the Hebrew. I know. In the Hebrew, you mentioned day, and do you have a, a term for 24 hours? That's a Layla. That's a, um, uh, no, no, that's a Yom. Yeah, so Yom in Hebrew is 12 hours. Yom and Layla together is Yemama. And that's the 24 hours and that's feminine. So Yom, the 12 hours is masculine, Yemama is feminine and that's uh, 24 hours. There's so no that's... term for it in English. So we went for sun and sunset. That's totally a free translation, which we don't often do. But because sun has a masculine connotations in English because of English poetry and because of Christianity, we went with that. And so my question, so, yeah. so my question is, 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 and I'm thinking of language and gender in general. Um, right. Are we, are you, is a general concept would be, would a general concept be masculine and then specific and unique feminine? Because this is no, not, not necessarily. necessarily. Okay. No. And the, the thing is, and, and I don't know if it's the same in Arabic, uh, I would imagine. So, but maybe be, because of the Hebrew Bible, uh, a lot of the gendered um, terms that are, you know, not human or not animate are personifications waiting to happen, much more than in other gendered languages like French or German, okay? So when you, when you say a, the word city or country, Aritz or Il, it's immediately a woman because there is a, a metaphorical system in the Hebrew Bible that feminizes all place names, okay? And, and it's similar for other basic terms. So um, there is this very, very strong investment in turning abstract or concrete, but not human, uh, inanimate, terms into women or men. What Amichai loves is the queering that Hebrew allows. There's no neuter. So the, um, the exceptions to the rule, and he used to teach Hebrew grammar, are the ones that end up being um, uh, really, really uh, of interest to him because they allow this undoing uh, of the binary. Hmm. It's very interesting, and there's a lot to, to talk about uh, oh, because sure there are also it. feminist explorations into Arabic that are very similar to... I would uh, send me but, some references if there are any... Yes, but for another, another time, I just wanted to check some things because it, it sounded a little bit similar to what, what's happening uh, with some feminist Arab poets uh, in general. So thank you. I'll, I'll let other people talk. Sorry, I talked for long. So as long as we're still on that poem that's being shown, um, uh, uh, Joel Katz noted that his question was that I'm still not understanding how the sign over the door relates to the rest of the poem. So if you could perhaps... Uh... Right. So, you know, it's... I, I really don't want to just read it allegorically or, you know, as a political slogan. I mean, on one level, it's just as, you know, this is a cafe and there's a sign over the door. But here he is portraying this uh, kind of messianic peace on earth, right? Picture in this binational city and on this cafe where everybody lives in peace and the feminine, the masculine, the one and the many are all together. 
And at the end, there is that sense of, you know, if you want a critique of capitalism, a critique of nationalism, the idea that uh, we are not responsible for your possessions, right? We're not taking possession, not taking responsibility for anything that you may have lost. And the word that he uses for lost is exactly the term that's used um, for um, the description of the Palestinian disenfranchisement and, and the, the, the lost territories, houses, et cetera. So, yeah. Great. But it's um, very subtle. It's incredibly subtle. It's really a sin to turn this into a sloganeering kind of thing. Uh, from a Zeitlin asks um, whether you have had access to Amichai's unpublished papers, and if so, whether there are unfinished poems. Yeah, I actually published one of at least one of them in my in my book, uh, The Full Severity of Compassion, uh, which is a title of a poem. Uh, I include a lot of information from his uh, archives, which are uh, at Yale University. Not all of them are open. There's a period of about 10 years that um, his widow is keeping closed for the time being at least. But I, I, had, I went over every single piece of paper that I, I could and um, Nanette Stahl is here uh, and uh, she helped me a lot as the curator at, at Yale. Um, and I spent uh, two consecutive, not consecutive, but two long periods of research there and incorporate that. And um, there are, he told me, for example, that he kept writing quatrains in the Arabic style and he kept saying that it's not the Fitzgerald translations but using the rhyme schemes from the medieval period. Um, and that I'm gonna see it uh, after 120. I only found two. So they, they must be in the unpublished, uh, in the unopened part of the, of the archive. Nanette, do you know anything about that? No. Um, Moshe Levin wanted to ask a question. Nanette, I don't see you, so I'm, uh, but we can come back to that. Uh, mute. Uh, more important than any question is gratitude. This has been a marvelous hour. I can't believe you fit so much in and you made so many things clear about the Yudha Michai. I've been reading his poetry, studying it with my brothers from a different translator, and one understands why he's really the poet laureate of Israel. Um, I'm prepared to wait until uh, the session is over, Chana, because you said that you would stay afterwards because I've got uh, something to comment on, discussion, question about really almost every poem you said. Would that be preferable or should I no, just- No, no, don't go ahead. I think okay. the people who All need right. to leave can leave, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. The first poem about Yom Kippur, um, where I, I find that he he makes believe he's doing teshuva, but he doesn't do teshuva at all. They do, because, exactly, yeah. Yeah, the laws of Maimonides, the Rambam on teshuva, is that the first thing you have to do is admit you were wrong. And he doesn't admit that. He, the first thing he does is he gives an excuse. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, uh, the, 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 it's, it's no, not an apology, it's not an admission at all. And uh, the, the other thing about it um, is the symbolism of going to the synagogue, but for him, the synagogue is this Arab shop because he's talking about this or uh, the special light. And the, it, it's a reference, I'm sure, to Ne'er Tamid, but he ends yes. up- Yes, with yes. The, yeah, but he ends up with the last line saying, you know, uh, and I, I, I returned home with the other worshipers. So, he doesn't stay with the connection he makes with this Arab shopkeeper. Even, and, and, and he's saying, look, you and I are in the same boat. You got fired by the Israelis. My father's store got fired by Arabs or something, but then he walks away. So 
he's ex expressing the, the, the terror or the conflict there. I'm very- But I think it's, it's Amichai, it's Amichai, uh, the poet, uh, making this ironic commentary, making us see if we care to look carefully what his speaker, what this character is not seeing. And maybe by the end of the poem, he is seeing it because he is uh -huh. saying he's going back. Yeah, I don't think this is Amichai's position at all. Otherwise he would have made a, a better attempt at it. It's, it's so obviously wrong. Yeah, right? thank you. That's very good insight. I didn't think of that. Yeah, um, maybe, poem, um, um, let's maybe, not get excited. Maybe we'll take he's a- talking a, about a, translation a and so on. And I love the line where he said, like the father's figure shows up in the grandchild. That the, that the generation in between doesn't resemble the father. It's the grandchild that has those features. And then he uses a lot of Aramaic, Talmudic language there. That's, as you pointed out, that's the formula we say when we burn the chametz right before Pesach, which yeah. in a sense is self-contradictory. I give up all of my rights to the chametz that is in my property and not in my property, or my ownership, not my ownership. And then he does the shtika kehodaya. That's a Talmudic phrase on matters of Jewish law. Where it Rabbi says, Levin, um, I see there's somebody else raising their hand. So um, we'll take maybe yeah, one more okay. qu question, um, Martin. Yeah, okay. Uh, Let me thank you, Moshe. Did you want me to answer that? No, you're the boss. Did you want me to? I mean, I, I just, I can, I can um, address all of the Aramaic, right? A and the, the, um, the use of Jewish law here is really marked because there is a way in which he is anchoring the resistance to being original, to having the first or the last word. Uh, both in Jewish law, right, which is always an interpretation of interpretation and always talks about um, the outside chance that something is the case, right? Um, and in genetics, in the science, right, that uh, very often it is the, the father in between that, does, that just transmits the genes but doesn't actually um, uh, manifest it. Now, behind the scenes, what he's not telling us because of his egalitarian approach is that the focus is really on literary historiography. He is articulating the Russian formalist idea that, you know, uh, in particular, Yuri Tinyanov's version that, um, in the transition from one generation to another, for example, from Bialik's generation to um, the uh, modernists, the early modernists in Palestine, uh, Altelman and Shlonsky, and then to his own generation, the generation of the statehood, uh, what happens is that the grandson identifies with a grandfather, but instead of having this conflictual model of right, the grandson rebelling, rebelling edipally against the father by identifying either with an uncle, according to Shklovsky, or with the grandfather, according to Tinyanov, there is that erotics of transmission. Transmission is something wonderful, loving. It's not an edipal conflict at all. Thank you. So we have one last question from uh, Martin Bobrowski, and then we will conclude. Martin, you can ask your question. Uh, could you expand a little on the uh, poem which links 1967, the year of forgetting? What is he forgetting? What does he want us to forget? How did his readership and how did the general Israeli public interpret that? That's a great question, Martin. Thank you so much. It's the year in which we collectively forget, 
right? What uh, this has, this big conquest that everybody is so drunk with, right? So enthusiastic about. We forget what it was like for us to be vanquished. We forget what it was for us to be victims. Um, and it's the year, instead of saying the year of conquest, the year of um, <clears throat> celebration, right, of the Six Day War. Uh, it's the year in which we turned Israel into an occupying force. And uh, at the time, this was not, let me stress, in 67, this was the common view on the left, the Zionist left, not just the anti-Zionist or this is before post-Zionism, right? So this was a very common view that, um, you know, we have to return all the territories or else we are going forever to repeat what was done to us. We are going to destroy the character of uh, what could make Israel um, a more moral nation. Um, so how was it read? It was read and understood very clearly by people on the left. Uh, American literary scholars have all hemmed and hawed, even though they, they mentioned those two forms of uh, repentance uh, and, and know that it doesn't work in this poem, they kind of work around it. Um, it's amazing to see the acrobatics that people go through in order to accommodate uh, that image of uh, a nationalist poet not just a national poet, but a nationalist poet. Thank you for that question, Morton. Thank you so much, Hannah, uh, for being so giving with your wisdom. This is just an amazing afternoon, so thank you. Um, thank you, Emily Brewer, for your support, and thanks to everybody for being with us. This was just really special. Um, I did just put in the chat a link to our second session on Amichai, if you would like to register for it or want information, that's going to be uh, a week from Wednesday. And I uh, want to wish all of you uh, good health, have a good evening, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all so, so much.